Um, so tonight we've got uh, James Harvey uh, talking about the Dunning Kruger effect. Uh, before uh, I hand over to James, so, uh, I just want to draw your attention to lots of free stuff over there, which if you don't take home, I have to. <laughs> but there's loads of really nice stuff. So we've got a range of t-shirts for you to, uh, for you to wear. Uh, so uh, the, we've, uh, this week we've, um, we've had a bit of a change in sponsorship. So we've uh, so now Magra are, are, are a secondary sponsor, e renewed as well, again. So the uh, the health of the uh, of the group is is pretty good at the moment. Nice so, to be so so what we're looking to do is beyond uh, some of the events that we run, look at other ways we can uh, advocate agile in South Wales. So if you have any ideas or if you have any ideas for topics that you, you want to hear about. Please let one of the organising team know. Okay. Uh, so that leaves me to say, welcome, James. Uh, Thanks, Dave. <laughs> uh, Hi, James. Hi, James. Hi. <laughs> uh, and please join me in uh, giving James a round of applause. So just on that note, what Dave was saying, I think as far as ideas go, we've got two sessions booked out of the next three, or one? one out. So we've just got one out of the next three sessions booked with one potentially about to happen. So if anyone wants to come and do a talk, you are more than welcome. And as we've always said, we always want to encourage you guys to talk as much as getting expert speakers in as well. So if there's something you want to come and share, then please do so. Especially war stories. You know, when, when things haven't gone well for you and your organisation, or how you do it, you know, what problems you've been having. Uh, you know, so it can be, a, a, it doesn't have to be a, a lecture style, it can be anything you want it to be. So it can be an open you know, round table discussion. That kind of thing. Would you be interested in co-creating a game mm. for a talk that I have to do in February in Florida? Yeah. Can we come to Florida? <laughs> <laughs> if you pay for it. <laughs> Thank you, Magra, for the sponsorship. <laughs> 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 well, I have the bare bones of concept of the game. I'm going to get the materials very shortly, and if anyone is interested in helping me build it, and I need a 10 player at least, this might be a useful way of doing it. Yeah, we were talking about doing a game night anyway, so it might be a really good opportunity to do that with some other things as well, so that would be really cool. But yeah, we always talk about everyone coming and doing some talks. Sean's organised some uh, some sort of shorter, what's the word I'm looking for? Ignite. Ignite talks in the past, and I'm sure we'll do more of those. Um, but, you know, we're here as much to develop these skills as we are to learn from each other as well. So, um, so yeah, please do not be shy. Um, we're starting to record these as well. So we've, we've set up a YouTube channel now. Um, we've got a lot of comments from people that couldn't make the sessions and are we recording them? Are they available to view online? Well, they will be from this one onwards. Um, so I will promote that in the Slack channel and we'll send an email out as well. We need 100 subscribers before we can change the short name, such as the naming conventions. So, so let's make sure we can get that done by, uh, by the next meet. That would be really cool. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to do a talk today on a topic that really takes me out of my comfort zone. So this is a bit of a, a new experience for me. Um, I've done a lot of public talks before, I've talked at conferences, different meetups, but normally it's about a subject that I'm, you know, pretty, at least I think, pretty clued up on. Um, this is really an area that fascinated me when I started looking at it, so much so that I've kind of fallen into my own traps by doing a talk on it so early on, as we'll, we'll come to explore in a second. Um, but it was something that I really wanted to share with people because as I started to learn more about Dunning Kruger and some of the lessons that we'll go through today, I really saw not only my own career, but I saw a lot of other people that I've worked with and, and have um, avoided working with, shall we say, uh, moving forward. And I think it really opened my eyes in many ways. And I think we as a group of, of agile practitioners, evangelists, whatever buzzword you want to throw at it, I think we can all be guilty from time to time of having such a strong opinion on something that we sometimes find it difficult to sort of look beyond the walls that are in front of us. So if nothing else, I hope we get out of today just a bit of self-reflection. Um, and as I said, I do not claim to be an expert on this subject, but it is something that the more I read about it, the more I'm fascinated by it. Um, and I'd love to get your thoughts and opinions as we go through today. So please shout out, just as you need no excuse to shout out and add comments. 
Um, so please do as we go along, we'll try and make it as collaborative as we can. Um, just very quickly about me, most of those of you who know me here will know me from Agile Snap. Um, some of you may know that Agile Snap is now part of the DevOps group. Um, so my role is very much um, heading up the, the DevOps Group Academy, which is still delivering public training, still delivering training to clients, but a big part of what we do now is working with local universities and hopefully beyond, um, and really helping to try and get Agile more, and DevOps indeed, more embedded in the syllabus um, of computer science um, and any IT uh, degree programs moving forward. So we do intern programs, grad programs, apprenticeships, placements, and all sorts of stuff. Um, and we do some really, really exciting things with universities, and, and I'm really, really pleased to be part of that. Um, Charlotte, who I promised I wouldn't single out and embarrass in front of everyone, still yeah, uh, is a great example. And I think, so Charlotte's one of our interns, she's joined us as an engineer, um, but because of the way we were able to kind of introduce Agile and DevOps concepts really early, Charlotte made the extremely wise decision that she wanted to become an Agile coach. So it really gives us an opportunity to work with people who typically wouldn't really think about that as a career until you've kind of gone through the industry a bit. Um, so it's really exciting to be able to do that. Cool, so what are we gonna talk about today? Um, we're gonna to talk about knowledge. We're gonna talk about what we perceive knowledge to be and why sometimes knowledge is scary. We're gonna talk about intellectual arrogance, which leads us on to Dunning-Kruger. And finally, we're gonna wrap that back into something that we should all be familiar with um, even if we're not necessarily as, as proactive at it as we possibly can be. But a big core value of Agile is obviously continuous improvement. Um, and to continuously improve, we really have to be pretty judgmental with ourselves. We have to be able to look in the mirror and, and as we said earlier on, see what's going wrong without necessarily stopping ourselves from seeing what's over the wall. So we're gonna go through each of these. Um, I've run this through this deck maybe once or twice a few months ago, so we could be in for a 20 minute job or we could be in for an hour and a half job. Please, um, 20 minutes. Yeah. yeah, we'll try, we'll try. Depends on how much James <laughs> shouts out, <laughs> how much he fundamentally disagrees with every style of film. It's not true. <laughs> okay, so I'll hand over to you to start with. So with the pe people who are around you, have a very quick 20 second conversation. What actually do we think knowledge is all about? Have a quick discussion amongst you and then we'll shout out some answers. <laughs> 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 Um, do you want it to be, I can crawl out, there it is. Okay, so shout out some, shout out some forwards then. What do we think knowledge is all about? Perceived wisdom. Hmm? Perceived wisdom. Okay, good one. Do we all agree? So, cool. Our model of reality. Okay. Can we expand on that? <laughs> Thanks for trying. Thanks for trying. <laughs> Organised facts. Okay, yeah. Anything else? Pertinent information. Pertinent information, okay. Anything else? Okay. So the actual definition of knowledge. Facts, I think we had that. Information and skills acquired through experience or education. The theoretical or practical understanding of a subject. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think we all get what knowledge is, but the thing that I think we often overlook when we're talking about knowledge is, and I'm sure we're all different in how we approach a certain subject, but if we want to learn about something, a lot of the time we have this concept of you know, we need to, to get more information. We, 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 as human beings, we've got this constant desire to learn about new things. I think in our role, specifically in, in Agile DevOps worlds, you know, we are there to challenge, we are there to, to disrupt. Um, and so we always have this mentality of continuous learning. We always have this desire to share and try things out and see if they don't work. So again, in your page, why do you think we crave knowledge? What is the reason in why we crave knowledge? Have a discussion. <laughs> <coughs> 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 
Can you give us the definition of the thing? Who asked you? Give us the definition of the What do you think is the Why do you want that learning? Okay, let's start sharing then, Dave. What did you guys say something else? Uh, we, we, we were talking about uh, to meet your needs okay. and various uh, levels of uh, fundamentally. Okay, so tell me one thing you learned recently. Got new knowledge on something recently, work, personal. Anyone else? Why do we crave knowledge as human beings? Why do we crave knowledge? <laughs> Mastery. Mastery, that's a good one. Say again. Improvement. Improvement, yeah. Anything else? Dave, you come back come back to you for your example, something you learned recently? Uh, I learned how to change the uh, chain set on my bike. Okay, why did you why you want? Because yeah. it kept skipping and I was going to die. <laughs> Survival. Yeah. 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 We crave knowledge because we want to, as we've said, we want to improve. We want to, um, we want to learn new things. We want to be able to do new things or support new things, things like that. That's all good and uh, very good and true, but I think a lot of the time we have this, this issue when we start to learn about something that we see knowledge as, as a bit of a finite thing. We see this container that we effectively need to fill up with knowledge before we understand that thing. And more often than not, once we fill that thing, whether it's through reading or doing some, you know, we'll read a little book, blog posts, maybe watch some YouTube videos or whatever, fill it with some practical examples of doing that thing. And I think all too often we get to that point where we think we've filled up the knowledge of, of a particular subject and then we're happy that we we know about that thing, and then we start to believe that we are maybe not an expert, but we know enough about that thing to have a strong opinion on that thing. And you see this a lot within the agile world. There is never a more entitled agile practitioner than someone who's just done a scrum master, a certified scrum master course. <laughs> is that how you end your training? Yeah. yeah. Go away. <laughs> never speak to you again. Just do all this stuff a bit. No, 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 no. <laughs> So this is really dangerous. Having this, this kind of capacity that we feel like we have to fill. And you can kind of you think back of, of stuff in your personal lives and in your work life that you kind of know about. There's always a point, generally speaking, where you feel like you know enough. And sometimes that's true, but I think we always want to challenge ourselves to try and get to that next level and understand it's only when you get to a point of I don't know what I don't know ahead of me is when you can start feeling like you actually appreciate the, the, the size and vastness of the thing that you're trying to learn. So to try and articulate that, let's explore this question. Why are we afraid of not knowing something? So we've talked about why we might go away and learn some knowledge, but why is it that we want to learn that? To not to, why are we afraid of not knowing the particular thing that we're going, going out to? So what are the consequences of not knowing something? Anyone want to shout out? Do you want to have a conversation? Have a conversation? Yeah, thank you. Humiliation? Yeah. Yeah, not fitting in. <laughs> if, gaining, if gaining knowledge is considered you know, admirable and therefore status related, so not knowing reduces your status. Yeah. You want to make the best decision you can about it. If you yeah. know you don't know something, then you know you're going to make a poor decision. Yeah. Desire to have control. 
Good one. Not being seen to be weak if you're working in an environment that kind of preys upon other people, where sometimes you're seen as if you put your hand up and say you don't know something, that's showing a sign of weakness. And that's that's gonna be, that was going to be right? my next question: is how comfortable are we with not knowing something? I don't know. Ooh. Oh, Dave, we got him. We got him. <laughs> Were you comfortable saying that? Very. We <laughs> clicked. <laughs> so generally, I think as a as a race, we are particularly afraid of not knowing something if we perceive others know something better than us. Mm-hmm. This subject often came up when when and Dave and I had this conversation around public speaking and how one of the biggest fears for people public speaking is that people in the audience know the topic better than the person up, up front talking about the thing. I mean, I came to terms with that months ago, which is why I'm pretty happy to stand up here and, and talk bullshit for 20 minutes about something that I'm sure you all <laughs> know more about. <laughs> um, Do you think it's linked to the relevance to your context? Though? So I'm not that afraid of not knowing how the space shuttle works. But... <clears throat> you know, I'm kind of afraid of not knowing how the plumbing in my house works. Yes, I think it, but, it's, it, but I think the so you can relate things that you don't need to know versus things that you think you need to know. And I think what we're trying to get at here is we're trying to get to the place where we we're in a position where we really do need to know something. So we fill that container up with knowledge, but then we stop because we think we know what we think we know. So is that related to peer group things where Sean may be talking about it, with your mates down the club, when you go, oh yeah, you're bored, packed up, you need to do this, and you go, yeah, you yeah, know what, oh, yeah, I know There's that. a good fast show sketch right. that does that, yeah. Exactly, as opposed to, oh, nobody's going to, no, none of my peer group expect me to know how the speech not work, because I know that they don't know that. Either, <laughs> right? My best friend's accountant, so I'd be very surprised if he knew anything. Well, I've been in business for 10 years, I still don't know how to battle. <laughs> That's what you pay an accountant, <laughs> Okay, so we're going to come back to that, but think about that for a while. Why are we afraid of people knowing that we don't something? And, and in fact, why are we afraid of, of not knowing something within ourselves? And we'll come back to that syndrome? in a bit. Yeah, we'll come back to that in a bit. So to start to introduce the Dunning-Kruger curve and the Dunning-Kruger effect, the, what I like to call the, the you-know-nothing John Snow graph, um, and this was the moment where I was kind of reading the textbook and it was like, you know, you talk about the penny drop and you draw drop in moments. This really was it for me. And I, when I first started looking at this graph, as we'll, we'll uncover it now, not only was I able to see my own career through here, as I said earlier on, um, and, and I was able to see other people around me and, and as I said, people that I'm, I'm interviewing, people that I see talking about certain topics. And it's, it was really kind of humbling to see it and really makes you sort of self-reflect on, on where you are. So the green line there is how much you think you know. The pink line demonstrates how much you actually know. And the blue line demonstrates how much more you realize there is to know. And typically, when you start learning about a, a subject down here, that you're in that kind of beginner phase, and you're open about the fact that you know nothing about the thing. I have no idea how to ride a motorcycle. Um, I, I'm quite open to that fact. So if I were to go and ride a motorcycle, you know, I'm pretty happy to, to realize that, um, oh, I could just sit on it. I mean, I, I can ride the car. Surely it's easy to sit on it, twiddle the throttles. Throttle. Good word, man. There you go. I'm sure I could figure it out. So kind of like the thinking I know thing gets up really quickly the minute you start dipping your toe in the water. We move very quickly from the beginner phase, and this is kind of like sitting in your agile training here, and then you're kind of, you know, I know about sprints and scrums and Agile Manifesto, you know, my, my green line's going well up here. And then you finish it and you enter this phase here. And this is what I see all the time. And as I said, I look back at my career and my first introduction to Agile was 12 or 13 years ago was, was by a scrum coach. And when I was first introduced, it was scrum, 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 scrum. So scrum was synonymous to Agile to me and vice versa. There was, there was nothing else out there. You know, to, to be agile, you do two week sprints. To be agile, you do retrospectives. To be agile, you have to estimate the story points. The stuff that you probably all heard many, many times when you get agile coaches in to, to help transition the organization or when you go on training or whatever. And this is a really scary place to be. 
Because basically your knowledge has not really increased an awful lot. You've just been taught a load of practices and techniques to use. But your perce perceived knowledge on the subject is now way up here. And this is often the point where people want to have an opinion on something, and a strong opinion on that. And again, looking back, I'm happy to sort of reflect back on my career, and I was the same thing. I was joining with organisations with, oh yeah, we should do Scrum, it's way better than Waterfall. I didn't even really know what the differences were at the time. And interestingly, one of the, one of the aspects of that is you seek out information that confirms your viewpoint at that yes. time, that somebody comes and attaches you in your belief. Correct. And you, you, you don't even bother researching anything else. Like, I, I often say the same thing when I'm talking to agile people now. It's kind of like, you know, have you done any waterfall projects? Are, are you, did you do your print certification back in the day? And it's almost like, well, no, man, why would I? And it's kind of like, well, you need to know the, the, the things we're trying to solve as well as why this thing is so good moving forward. Do you, do you think there's, a, sorry, with, uh, do you think there's an element of, when you're on the up curve there that you're doing agile, and when you get to the top, you may find realise that you need to be agile. And I don't even do think it. you're. I don't even think you're doing agile. This is your very. This is very kind of done your training. You're here now. Basically, what you're doing is you're saying, right, why the business? Don't care about you. The development team. <laughs> we're going to take all these big requirements that we get in, and we're going to break those down into user stories, and we're going to chop all our work into two week sprints. It's not really solving the problem. But you, you, people end up in this place, individuals and organisations, they end up in that place for, for years. And I, most of you in the room, or those of you in the room who have been sort of, you know, in coaching consultancy roles, you probably agree, me, agree with me when I say it's a very different space now than what it was five, six, seven, eight years ago. When eight years ago, you're going in, people perceive Agile as this silver bullet that's going to change the world. Nowadays, we're going in and undoing this shit. We're going in and saying, well, actually, all this failed. We've got to rebuild why it was nothing to do with Agile, but it was just to do with our perception of what Agile is all about. I, I wonder at what, what point you, on the app there do you start a blog? Or <laughs> sign up for Twitter? Oh, sure, <laughs> <There. laughs> That's a shot. Really? Stop talking oh, oh, shot. It's too easy. So easy. She knows I'm joking. No. Uh, I mean, for me, it was like it was there pretty much. I had my blog go in, it was like, yeah, all good. Uh, I imagine that, that the, the way you kind of cross the peak is to be quite traumatic. Yeah, and, and I think most people. <laughs> 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 it could be, oh, come on, fraud, <laughs> like a massive fraud. It, but I think the scary thing is that it, a lot of people don't even realise they've crossed that peak until, until way further on. And, and that, it's, that, it's that moment of self reflection. And it's being open and honest with yourself, and like I said, realizing actually, retrospectively, I've just been preaching about Scrum for the past so then, three years. So, so another scenario, just to just think of a conversation we had. Another scenario on that, right, is that we know somebody that's been in the industry a long, long time, and now he hates it. He he's jumping from job to job to job to job because he hates. He's literally starting to hate that job, right? Goes in and he he's doing a gig and he, he hates it. So where is he? Where does he? Says he, he never Sorry, James. <laughs> <laughs> it's not James. But, you know, that's the flip side, I suppose. He's, he's now over the curve. He hates everything. He hates yeah. the organisation. He is. I think he's at that peak. He's at that peak. I think he's, he's at the point where he thinks he knows it all. And everyone else is an idiot. Shit. Right. And actually, it's not really like that's that. That's really sad, though, isn't it? It is. It gets you it to is. the other stack, to that other curve, which is the bottom, I think, I'm assuming. Yeah. So, no spoilers on there, so that you can see where this is going. Yeah. So, so this is the hazard phase, and this is the bit that we've been mostly going to focus on moving forward. But this is the, I'm an expert. I know everything. I've, I've ridden the motorbike once. Ask me anything about it, and I'll be able to tell you the answers. The, so just on that, though, there is a difference between theoretical and proficiency. Right? Of course. Because I've done exactly that. I did my CBT and never got back on a bike ever again. <laughs> I have once done counter steering on a motorcycle, and I've enjoyed it thoroughly. But as soon as you put me on a bigger engine, I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. It's really <laughs> so you got over the hill pretty quickly, though, because then, as soon as you got on that, it was like that was the realization. I'm going to shit myself. I'm yeah. going to die if I can't. Survival. This is what. This is what. Traumatic event. Yeah. No, I mean, absolutely. You and can be called out by someone for not knowing something. Right. You know, being when you when you realize the limitations of your own permissions are very quick. And I think this goes back to what we were discussing about being afraid to come across that you don't have the knowledge. So people often build this up because they are the ones who should be. And again, you know, it's a bit different now, but going back five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years ago, 
when you are looking at a transition to an agile way of working, there's probably one person in that organization who's been on the Scrum Master course, who's now the agile person in that organization. So they're gonna have to feel inside themselves that they're kind of up here, because now all of a sudden they are the ones perceived with all the knowledge on the subject. So what's pushing them to kind of develop themselves when they are in this bubble of, I know everything about agile. So what we're trying to do is move out of this hazard phase into the experts phase, which ironically brings you back into the I know nothing phase. But this is actually a realization that shit, there's a ton of stuff left to learn, which is the exciting part, which is why we're all sat around in this meetup today and beyond. Um, and we quickly get to a state where we can come to terms with actually what we do know, and we can start to level off where we think our, our knowledge is versus actually it's about it's about right and I'm, I'm going to show a few examples later on but there are tons of studies that have been done here in, in many different fields around you know asking people before the fact what their perceived knowledge is then doing a test and then coming out and seeing the, the differences in where their knowledge knowledge actually is or what they thought is insane so for the sake of today, this is the area that we're trying to focus on, on, on stopping. It's this idea of Mount Stupid. And it's harsh but fair, I think, is the best way to describe that. And, and as I said, I, I'm, I'm in a position where I can look back at my career. And I, as I said earlier, I can see where, when I sort of pitched up up there for a long time. And I think you get to a certain point where it's, you don't want to hear anyone else. And you're almost, you get back to that fear of not knowing something along with something. And it, it does take a lot of humility to be able to sit down and say, do you know what, actually, I can learn a lot from you, and I can learn a lot from that person, I can learn a lot from that person. And when you're starting to hire people based on how much they can actually teach you, that's when you know you've finally started to come right down there. It doesn't matter what level of experience they are, if you feel like you can learn something from an individual, then you're on the right path. So you this would apply, I guess, equally apply to sort of groups of people. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's echo chambers, right? Because yeah. when you're in a group, and it's one of the one things that happens a lot in Agile, and, and you've experienced this, it's the, that way of doing things. And you know, we've had people come to us where so they've been in a bubble for two, three years, doing what they perceive as Agile. And they've had no reason, they've not even seen the descent that's down here. They're not even anywhere near that kind of, it's going to be a, a painful bubble when that gets burst, when someone comes in and says, actually, you know, yes, you, you might be pretty good at Scrum. Look at all that stuff that's out here as well. How do you think people would cope with the, you know, when, once you can see the vastness as a domain, you know, do you think simplifying that deliberately would be a coping strategy? I think, again, it's, it's kind of how, in my perception anyway, it's kind of how we've dressed up Agile over the years. And, and, you know, as you know, a lot of, a lot of organizations don't want to hear that there's all this unknown stuff. They want to hear you coming to them with that silver bullet ready loaded that you've, you've rolled out an infinite amount of times over here. These are the blueprints do exactly that. A lot of organizations are on oil, right? Yeah. They, 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 lift and shift doesn't so work. This is how we've arrived at things like exactly. Thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, so this, this pattern is a one time thing. Yeah. This is a continual series of things exactly. that are going up and down. Yeah. Right? Organizations don't want to hear this stuff's going to take two years for us to get to that point, you know. So it's dangerous. It's dangerous and I encourage you all, as I said, to, to take a look in the mirror, see where you are on there, where you've been, because I think it's, it's often good to see where you made that kind of leap and realize that there's, there's always so much to learn. We, we work in an environment that, that is probably one of the quickest moving environments in the world anyway. Um, and the reason we do what we do is because we want to be as, as adaptive to that change as we possibly can. So therefore we should always, always, always be learning about new ways of doing things, regardless of whether you've been doing this for 10 years, 10 months, or 10 days. There's always stuff to learn. So Einstein had a great quote that kind of really sort of bolted this for me when I started looking more and trying to relate this stuff together about going back to the question around knowledge. And he came up with, you know, the only source of knowledge is experience. And I think, again, this aligns very, very nicely to what some of the stuff that we talk about 
within Agile is that we, you know, we, we work on an empirical model where we do stuff, we try it, if it works, great. If it doesn't, then we don't do it. If it does, then we do a bit more of it, a bit differently. But we have to have the experience to be able to do that. We have to do stuff before we get the experience. It's interesting, when we cite a side story point in Velocity and Berlin, like this is an empirical model, but then you refuse to do anything when it doesn't yeah, work. Yeah, exactly. You carry on doing it. So experience is key to all this. And, and again, I think experience as a word in general kind of lends itself to this idea that you know to be experienced in something you've got to, you know you've got to be an industry veteran or whatever and i always say to people you know it doesn't matter if you're a brand new grad you've still got experience and stuff it's just a lot less experience than someone else but you bring a different experience to the table so to get the knowledge that we want we have to use experience to do that so we're going to play a little game and this is my warning before the game if you're not going to play properly then don't bother playing at all because some of you forget the answers. Okay, so we've talked a lot about perceived knowledge. We've talked a lot about what we think uh, about bubbles and how sometimes you think you know the, know the way it forward and there's no rights or wrongs. So a few quick fire questions. Shout out the answers, please, when you hear them. What was the shout at the back? Well done. Most people say CO2. What does SOS stand for? Safe on Sunday. Safe on Sunday. Where do bagpipes originate from? Wales. What's that? If anyone says anything other than Scotland, they will kill you. <laughs> See what you're doing there. There's no such thing as a trick question. Faisal <laughs> but Faisal. 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 What would you have said? What would you speak? Yes. Cat. Cat. Oh my god, so the monkey is the obvious one. Thank you. I've said that. Me. I got the wrong fruit. Yeah, yeah. He was on the monkey at the time, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was nice. <laughs> I like that. Right. It's the ride on the monkey. No colour. The colour line. Not red. Whatever, you're such an informed audience. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Check it on the but again, the point being is we, we think we know stuff that we might not necessarily know. So it's just reinforcing that message. This is a big, wordy, horrible slide, but just to kind of, this is some of the tests that were done just to reinforce the message of Dunning Kruger. Um, this was the, the test I was talking about earlier on with the whole perceived performance versus actual performance. Um, and the really interesting thing to note is that it's the, it's the people who thought um, so the, the, the triangle there is the perceived, what, what people think they tested, uh, what their test score is, and, and the dot, the circle one, is actually what they scored. And it's the people who know the least were the, were the most exaggerated as to what they thought they could achieve on a test. Again, going back to what we talked about earlier on about, you know, feeling like you don't want to not know something. So it's, as I said, go and have a look at some of these tests. They're super interesting. And then the other interesting part is obviously it's the middle ground. That are the ones that are pretty spot on, the ones that are kind of still on in that learning journey as, as they get to that point. And obviously, as you get further up, you kind of you're more in tune there with where your your flow of knowledge is going versus what you perceive your, your knowledge is. How much you think you know is, is about aligned with where it should be. So there are tons of these, there are tons of interesting studies around it. Um, and as we said, those with the least ability are the most likely to overrate their skills in that area. And that's not necessarily a malicious thing, it's not that people are, are lying about stuff, but again, anyone who's been involved in interviews and, and, and recruitment will see this firsthand. You know, it's people thinking they know an awful lot about a subject and, and over-egging that, and then you sit them up in an interview and you ask them to explain something and you get a textbook answer, rather than actually an answer from that person's kind of heart and soul, if you like. So be aware of that. These are the people that are in that kind of that middle phase that we've been talking about here. Um, a few more unsighted quotes as part of my research, of course. So, an ignorant mind is filled with the clutter of irrelevant or misleading theories, facts, intuitions, strategies, ideas, that regrettably have a look and feel of useful and accurate knowledge. That really is Trump, right? <coughs> no, I think that's me. 
<laughs> and there's, there, there's tons of these quotes that are out there that I, I've been trying to find to tie it all back together. And again, it's just reiterating the way the human brain works and how we try to, to have all of these myths. And what do you think we're talking about in Agile? We're talking about these myth leading theories, strategies, algorithms. These are your BSDMs, your SAPES, your, your everything else, your scrums even. You know, anything that's written down that we try and perceive as verbatim, it's going, we're going to apply it verbatim and it's going to work for us. We're not talking about continuous learning, continuous growth, sharing that knowledge, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We're relying on stuff. Do you think it's, that's sort of been a picture of you? <laughs> do you think it's because uh, there's benefit for for trying to model stuff, right? So we want to. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm, absolutely, I'm absolutely not throwing this stuff out of the window. And I'm, I'm sure we've all got case studies and stories of where you know, we may have seen a, an off-the-shelf framework implemented and it's working really well. Mm -hmm. But one of the biggest frustrations when I ever hear anything from any client ever, and I've had this ever since I started really, is we want the Spotify model. Mm -hmm. And I hate hearing that thing. I'm so fed up with the Spotify model because yes, it's fantastic, it worked for them. But people expect you to be able to take that Spotify model and just plonk it in. And, and yes, there is obviously massive advantage in modeling this stuff and frameworking it. But if you don't approach it with that open mind of how much have I got to learn, what else is out there, you end up in that bubble yourself. Mm -hmm. this is just, you, you can take the Spotify model as a snapshot of it done at a point in time, and actually, you should have taken the Scrum mm -hmm. and that when it comes to life. Exactly. But we, what we've done is codify it. Yeah. Scrum, and other people have been yeah. codified. So people don't want to go on their own journeys anymore. And it's not about the journey for a lot of organizations. As we said, they want the model because they feel safer if they're using something that's tried and tested, even if it's tried and tested with a team that's not their team and an industry that's not their industry and, and like everything else. Not knowing, yeah, exactly. Not it's almost like this was it's almost like it was planted. It's more of a safety net as well, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Do you think you can see well, that? it's a perceived safety net. Yeah, because yeah. it's the same model as a franchise, right? Yeah. Do you think if you want to avoid the business, a franchise is a safety net, it's more of a tested, right? Do you think we're victims of our own success, though? Because, I mean, when you, when you talk about the people, the, the kind of companies you're there. <laughs> no, no, us as a, as a group, as that, yeah. an agileist, right? Um, I think we're the worst in many ways. I, I know, but I think. The companies that are now coming to the table who are looking for that silver bullet are your big banks, your big telecoms, your big energy companies, but, and all of those are risk averse, right? So they all, you almost have to have something in your hands when you walk in there, otherwise they're just going to go, be gone, foul spot, aren't they? Yeah, but I mean, some of them are starting to realise that they just can't, they just can't do it. Yeah, and there's only, lifting, there's yeah. only so many times they can fail in that middle zone before they actually realise that you can't make this stuff more, more accurate, you can't make this stuff yeah. more predictable, you just can't. Um, so has anyone seen the live witness news before? So this is my favourite way of summarising what we've just talked about, where people feel like they have to have an answer, they have to have some knowledge on a certain subject, and they're afraid of turning around and saying, actually, do you know what, there's so much I don't know about this thing, I want to learn, the easy option is to just say, yeah, I agree with that. We've all been in a meeting where it's happened. It's not frame breaking. However, the, uh, the Coachella Valley Music and Arts Festival wrapped up yesterday. It's a huge concert, goes over two weekends. It's out in the middle of the California desert. More than 60 bands have played at Coachella this year. Some of them big bands, some of them not so big, some up and coming bands. And, and you know, music fans in general love knowing about bands that no one else has ever heard of. So we decided to conduct an experiment. We sent a camera for the Coachella, and we asked people walking into the venue what they thought of a bunch of bands whose names we made up, okay? These bands are so obscure that they do not exist. <laughs> Except for one name you'll hear, we made all of them up, but that didn't stop people from saying they knew them in tonight's special Coachella edition of Live Witness News. <laughs> Dr. Shulma and the GI Clinic. Yeah. They're amazing. Yeah, they're always amazing. Yeah. He's really good on the flexing. Yeah, I'm really excited to see them live. I think that's going to be one of the bands that's going to be really great. Highlight. Yeah. Did yeah. you see them when they played at Lollapalooza? No, no, I didn't. Uh, I'm yeah. so mad. I'm 
be so mad. Have you heard of Shorty Jizzle and the Cumber Crush? Yep. Yeah. Have you heard about them and like how raw they are? Yeah, they're, I mean, they're really unique, for sure. They feel a little bit like a combination between like Bob Dylan and like a polka band. Yeah, um... Are you guys as excited as I am about the obesity epidemic? I, I just, I just like their whole style, like their whole genre. <laughs> see that in meetings with people that they they don't want to contribute to stuff but they don't want to be seen as the person saying actually I have no idea what the SDN is all about or I have no idea why we're doing a retrospective or I have no idea why we're estimating in the way that we're estimating but do you know what we're going to keep using story points because someone once told us that that's more that's easier than using time because it gives the developers a, a break and it means they don't have to be committing to time estimates we have to be in a position where we, we challenge this stuff and we actually want to keep learning and, and as we said, know that we don't know everything about a certain subject. So just to kind of, again, highlight what that Dunning Group curve is all about. So you start off with not knowing, you quickly escalate to that, I know everything about it, and then you start to sort of curve down and only when you sort of get to this point here is when you're kind of, as we said, you're realising that there's so much more ahead of you. Um, wisdom is not a product of schooling, but of the lifelong attempt to acquire it. Again, making sure that regardless if we spend another 20 or 30 years doing what we're doing, we're still always looking at how we can learn from, from colleagues, from, uh, you know, from anyone really. How can we continue to fill that tub up way beyond the capacity that we thought it was originally? And I can't keep hammering that message home enough. Because I still feel like, and I feel myself kind of falling into that trap from time to time, where you get complacent, and you feel like you know enough. You feel like you're comfortable within your bubble, and you don't want to be out of your comfort zone, because being out of your comfort zone puts you in that position that we just saw. Knowledge is of no value unless you put it into practice. Again, just kind of reiterating what we discussed about the empirical model. Um, we have to be constantly evolving, constantly trying new stuff, constantly in a position where we are experimenting and critically learning from the experience that we are getting. Unless we have that experience, we're wasting our time. We can't just keep going on theory and what we think is right. And just because it was right yesterday doesn't mean it's right today. And this is kind of what brought it back together to the Trump thing, really, is that when arguing with a fool, make sure he isn't doing the same thing. And I think a lot of us, again, have been guilty of this over, over the past. Especially within agile circles, because it's an interesting thing where you've got people that feel very strongly about one framework, one methodology over here, people that feel very strongly about one methodology, one framework over here. We both go hammer and tongs at it, forgetting the fact that actually both of these are underpinned by the same manifesto anyway, and the same core values, and actually we're both wrong. Yeah, even the people's front of Judea, right? <laughs> we, we have to be looking at this objectively. And, and as I said, we're fortunate or unfortunate, depending on how you look at it, that there is, there is the, the, the biggest, most high-profile individual in the world right now is like a walking model for this, about someone who talks knowledgeably, knowledgeably or percept, perceived, <laughs> perceived knowledgeably about something. Um, Pretty carby. <laughs> without actually knowing what the fuck he's talking about. Uh, and I think that's, you know, it's a great, mo it's a great example of all this stuff coming to life, really. It's a great example of somebody in a position where they think they know way more than they actually do, 
And even though people have called them out on it on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, there's still this kind of adamancy from him that, no, I'm right, you're wrong, I've got nothing more to learn. And that was really the, the underlying message, was don't be like this guy. I'm amazed he hasn't been assassinated yet. So I think he's got a slightly different thing going on. In, uh, there is an awful lot of that in there, 99% of it is, but I actually think he's, the one thing that he's doing smart is, is if I just keep lying in that, <laughs> it won't matter that people are calling out on it, I'll just keep going. And, I, and the 1% of people who I need will believe it. Yeah. I but then you can probably see a lot of agile coaches in that. Yeah. Right? Exactly the same approach. Right? Keep regurgitating the same stuff. People won't see the logic in it, but eventually it'll stick. So I, I worked for a head of agile transformation at a place in Edinburgh not long ago, who is exactly that, exactly that. And you're going, but you know, but you didn't know the difference between the table full of whip. <laughs> so, how do you, um, so now that we know that this problem exists, how do you help people over, over that hump safely? So let me get to that in a second, because I think what we're going to do in a sec is just round up by talking about yeah, the things that are important, how we can help bring people away from, from this way of, of working or this way of thinking effectively. So essentially the, the kind of the key takeaways, and we've got a few more slides to go, but the key takeaway I want people to take from today's session is, is ultimately don't be a drunk. So have a lot of humility, and that's something that I think comes with experience. I think it's very rare that you find humility early on in your career, which is how we end up in that position of going through the curve anyway. And I think it's very difficult sometimes you know, to, to sit down and, and admit that you're wrong, maybe admit that your way is not necessarily the only way. And only really when you can start doing that and you can appreciate, if nothing else, where, what other people's views and opinions are, um, is really when you can start, start you know, really fulfilling this, um, uh, this way of working. Don't be afraid of the unknown. And, and I know that's easier said than done. And again, we are, we are creatures of habit and we are creatures of reducing risk wherever we possibly can. Um, but ultimately, we have to take leaps of faith sometimes, especially when we're working in an empirical way. Yes, there are times to make more informed and, and kind of strategic decisions, but sometimes we just have to evolve and adapt and change and take that leap of faith and not be afraid of, of, of what's ahead of us as long as we understand that there is a, so much more that we can learn. Uh, learn from everyone, we've covered that. It's not just about listening to expert speakers and, and whatever, you know, learn from the people around you. Everyone has experience that you can gain from, from the new grad all the way up to the person who's been in the industry for 30 years. They're all, all, all different experiences, but we can, we can take value from that. Like we discovered, knowledge doesn't end. It doesn't have the finite capacity, especially in this uh, in, in this world, in this industry. There is always, always more that we can do to, to enhance our knowledge. Dave, how many books you read at the moment? Too many. <laughs> Dave, you need to practice what you preach and work in progress. Yeah, yeah. 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 Reading in progress. Does Mr. Man count? But I think again, if you're if you're if you're serious about agile, like being agnostic is the only way to go. And I think it, even if you don't necessarily believe in things like Safe or Scrum or the SDM, it's, it's always good to try and understand what problem that's trying to solve. But just one, just one. Yeah. I think I'm agreeing. Agree, right? right? <laughs> We're like on the same page. The same way. This is a cost. Take the bits from them that work for you. Right? Absolutely. Um, in Daryl's group, we talk an awful lot about ingredients and we talk an awful lot about sort of recipes and cookbooks. And the idea here is that we come up with all the ingredients. You might put them together in a, cook, in, in a recipe, and that recipe might appeal to one organization or team, it might not appeal to someone else. But ultimately, we're trying to build up this cookbook which is full of recipes and full of ingredients, and you do with them what you want. So, what I'm saying is that's the exact thing with the client had a cookbook that was, this is the way we do our dialogue. Well, you've got a cookbook, it's not a cookbook, you've got a recipe, yeah. it's a single recipe. Yeah. What you need to do is put a cookbook of ingredients, so you just do something different, yeah. right? Well, you'll go like, I don't really like buckwheat flour, I'll do something else. Yeah. Yeah. But then, you know, that's just exactly what you're doing. So, on that note, fail safely, you have to try these things. We have to create environments where failure is, is certainly not terminal, although I suppose it might be terminal, in which case you've just saved yourself X amount of years of pain before you get to that point. But we need to create environments where experimentation is the norm. Trying new things, 
not just blindly, but based on the experience that you are making from, from being on this journey, you have to be able to fail, because that's part of the course. And you'll probably fail more than you'll succeed. It's how you react to it. And, and obviously, on that note, practice empiricalism, always and without exception. Always do something and, if it, and, and measure it and then do it again if it works. Um, so does knowledge equal success is, is the fundamental question, I guess, that we're trying to answer with, with, with the talk today. And I'll, I'll try and wrap this up now. Um, Winston Churchill, who I'm kind of conflicted on, because the guy was a bit of a dickhead, but he's always got a quote for everything. And I, his, his works are fascinating to read. And this one is great to hear. So success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts. And I think, again, that's really, really true of what we do on a daily basis. We, we are not trying to necessarily find what the end solution is, but we are always trying to succeed on an ongoing basis. Failure might not completely stop us, but how we can find ways to continue and use that empirical model to enhance our learning is, again, why we're all sat here. Um, and finally, not to go through this, I mean, this is just a standard feedback loop, but this is again to reiterate that sometimes this isn't enough. Sometimes we do feedback loops. I mean, hands up here who does retrospectives. In your retrospectives, how often do you question the core processes and, and things and, 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 and um, uh, ceremonies and everything else that you do? Really? Because most of the time we do a retrospective, but it's kind of covered, we protect that, rep, that, um, that feedback loop with as much as we can to avoid the unknown outside, to avoid all the stuff that we don't know, because we've decided we're going to work in two week iterations now, we've decided we're going to do a stand up every day, we've decided that we're going to do planning on here, and I think we have to be able to look outside of that sometimes, and I, I do think that sometimes we feel like we can't do that. And that might be true in some environments, but we have to be able to challenge where we are. Um, and finally, yes, getting rid of a, of a delusion makes us wiser than getting, getting hold of, of the truth. And I just wanted to talk about um, the Oakland A's for a moment. Uh, has anyone seen the film Moneyball? Go A's. So this is another amazing thing to look at if we're talking about um, challenging what you perceive to be the norm. And the, the, the general spoilers, the general concept of this film is that they were, they were a major league baseball team with a very small budget. And rather than kind of doing what the league perceived as the best way to win games is, which was going out and signing superstars to, to huge contracts, um, because they were able to hit home runs like there's no tomorrow, they actually crunched the numbers and they realized that all we need is kind of mediocre guys who can hit to first base and not go out, basically. So they're eliminating that, that high risk um, thing. And they were able to sign players for a fraction of the budget, and they didn't quite uh, win the, the, the World Series from memory, but they got pretty close to it with like literally 5% of the budget of the Red Sox or the Yankees, whatever, won it that year. It's a really good film. Um, but it's another example of where we, because people challenge what we perceive to be the best solution to something, we were able to find a better way of doing something. And we realized that our knowledge, there was so much more that we didn't know. We thought we crunched the numbers, we thought we knew all the answers, but there was way, way more to it than that. I told you it wouldn't take 20 minutes, didn't I? Um, and actually, finally now, um, I just wanna, as I've said throughout today, really, it's, I encourage you all to go and take a look in the mirror and reflect on your career to where you are today. And try and figure out where you where you did where you were able to kind of jump over that um, that curve when you did start to, to see the light ahead of you, where you did start to see there was so much more to learn. And if you're not there, then I encourage you to, to make that bold step, to jump into the unknown, and to, to bring that humility back in and figure out how you can advance your your career um, in the agile world that, that we have. And as I said. There's a lot of stuff that we do by ritual that we probably don't ever question. The Daily Standard is one of my pet hates when I go into any organisation because in the, in the 10 years I've been working with agile teams, I've very rarely seen this work the way it's intended to be. And it's again another example of, no, this is just something that we do. We know everything about this and why we do it. 
and it's not actually there. So just to tie it back into a real tangible thing that everyone can relate to, very rarely are these done properly. And that's it. So it's a bit of a roundabout journey, but I was really excited to share this stuff because, it, like I said, it, it was something I was able to relate to really quickly, and I'm really keep to keep exploring this stuff. So maybe I'll have a follow-up in 12 months or something. Um, but if anyone does have any questions, I'll, I'll do my best to, to answer them anyway. Did you submit that plan to Yes. Wow. <laughs> I need a sack match to it. <laughs> any other questions related to the team? I was going to say that sometimes the <laughs> most perceptive or is um, change making questions come from people who haven't got an expert knowledge and they're the ones who are afraid to ask those questions. Yeah, for that exact it, reason, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of this, I mean, obviously we, we haven't touched on, on a lot of the, the underlying things here, but it's another reason why you start with your, you know, you try and address your culture first. And if you give people a culture where they feel like they can fail, fail safe and fail early, they feel like they can contribute, if your culture's right, then you shouldn't have that position. You're exactly right, where actually people who know nothing about something often ask the best questions. It's why kids are so good at asking questions, because they have no preconceptions. They don't give a shit if they're offending anyone. They just want, they crave that knowledge. So they're asking you the raw questions to satisfy the, the, the questions in their own minds. And, and again, in the business world especially, we're far too worried about A, not knowing something, and B, offending someone else. But a lot of the time, we don't even bother to, to try to, 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 to enhance our knowledge in that regard. So yeah, it's an excellent point. Top quality poker players find it harder to play against absolute novices than they do against other top quality poker players. Because mm. they all know how to play the game, they've got all the nuances. You get a completely newbie comes along and just goes in all in on like, you know, seven and two pairs, and they go like, well, they must have aces, fold, and then they go, oh well, shit. And they find them really difficult to play against because they're wide, they don't, they don't understand, right? That's the first. That's the disruptor that you. That's the disruptor that you need to throw into a, an organisation or an organisation that's sort of stagnated on this. We've set our agile stall out, and that's how we're going to run it. It's, 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 it's those kind of all-in guys that you want to throw into that mix. Gives oh. you the honest truth. So I wonder how. So one, the position I find myself in is I, I. I think I appreciate how much I don't know, but it's. I find it quite uh, almost demoralising. I, I feel like my... Or is that intellectually arrogant? <laughs> <laughs> uh, to my dysfunction is that I'm, I want to know like, as much as I can, and I know that we can't do it. So in terms of that, and maybe how you get out, how you safely bring somebody over the peak, what is... You know, I think the, a good way the bit that it? keeps me going, and the bit that kind of when I... It's, you need to reach that point, I think, in our domain at least, where you 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 realise that you're never gonna you're never gonna have the answers. And it's not like learning to play a piano, for example, where I mean I'm sure you can still develop and improve when you get to a certain point, but you will reach a plateau at some point where you are now an amazing expert piano player, and there's not much more that you can learn. And you will know that. Whereas we obviously exist and, and, and work in a, in a world where fundamentally our job is to constantly look for new ways of improving, even if we are, even if we do feel like we're doing a pretty good job. And because there is no textbook that will exactly tell us how we can do that, I think for me when I made peace with that fact, and when, when all this humility started kind of gushing in, it was kind of at the point of, well, I'm never going to know everything. But what I can do is use the last 10 years worth of experience of what, what I've tried and what doesn't work and what, what does work, coupled with working with people like yourself who bring another 10 years worth of experience and a completely, a completely different 10 years of experience. And I think it's getting to the point where you, you don't, you're, you're not being looked at or you, you shouldn't, the expectation is not there to know everything. It's there to be able to guide around the challenges and problems that we've got using that experience. And again, it's that fail early. And I think it sounds like a personal challenge for you, maybe. And, and when you need to just snap out. <laughs> and, and so I find that, I get that a lot yeah, with contracting. I'll go into a gig, and I think the one I'm in at the moment, I've been in there about a month. I've been in this one group for about three weeks. And we'll be sat around the table, and I'll be minding my own business, and we'll be doing blah, blah, blah. And then we'll go, they'll hit a problem. 
and it's got nothing to do with any of that, I'm an expert in the thought, but because I'm the agile expert, so I'll go, let's ask our agile coach. And then first thing I go, I'm not an agile coach, so stop that nonsense altogether now, right? But their immediate reaction is that, well, well there's an expert in the room, we must ask them because we must know the answer and we want an answer. When it comes back to this, we need a blueprint, just tell us the answer. And, I, and I, I know you've got to be quite honest with them and go, oh. I suppose it goes back to, you know, the difference in coaching versus the difference in teaching, right? At the end of the day, as a, as a, in a coaching capacity, you're there to help someone extract the best out of themselves, ultimately, by, by you know, helping them find that inner peace. You don't need to be the expert to do that. You know, like golf players, for example, they're putting coaches and they're swing coaches. We, it always puzzled me that. I was like, well, why is Tiger Woods getting, uh, this was like 10 years ago, why is Tiger Woods getting advice from some coaching guy? Why isn't that coaching guy beating Tiger Woods on the tour? Mm. Not because he's a better golfer or knows more about golf and it's his expertise. It's, it's working with that person to find that, that sort of perfect balance. So I think it's just, you know, it's, it's about realizing, I think, that, that, that we will never know all the answers. And that's, that's, that's fine because that's not part of what we, we're, we're ultimately responsible for doing. If anything, we we are there to, to ultimately raise more questions so that we can at least look at how we can tackle.